after these in-depth sessions of the afternoon on storage, energy communities, e-mobility, research and innovation, we um, will be having the final uh, debate on um, Repower EU, because today is a big day. Um, it's actually a big day for two reasons. One reason, which has already been said often, is that the Repower EU um, package has been launched this noon in Brussels. And so you'll see in the next days a whole debate about this Repower EU coming. And just fresh from the, uh, <laughs> the launch, we will have uh, a panel here commenting on this and what it means for the island. But it's actually a important day for a second reason. And it's uh, Marina who pointed that out. Today, five years ago, the declaration of Valletta was signed, which actually launched this whole thing. Without it, we might not have been here together. So I think that's uh, an important birthday. Uh, on the 18th of May um, 2017, the declaration was signed, which led to this initiative, led to the parliament to fund it and the commission to uh, uh, organize a secretariat. So important. So these two things are coming together in the debate. My name is Alex Hadzibiros. I'm project manager and coordinator of European International Cooperation at the Samsung Energy Academy. Samsung is uh, uh, an island in Denmark. Um, and the Energy Academy is um, the NGO that facilitated the energy transition of the island. Um, and I'd like to introduce to the panel um, Ero Alio from the European Commission. Uh, he's advisor for energy and local governance, DG Energy. Uh, Kostas Komunos, and general manager of Daphne, uh, the uh, Network of Sustainable Greek Islands, Aegean and lately Ionian as well. And Maria Gotari, she's with us uh, through uh, video link. She's research associate for climate at the European University Institute. Um, and Soren Hermansen, director of the Samsung G Academy. Thank you very much for being here. And in the program, it's mentioned that this is the final debate. So I would really like to have a debate. Um, so I'd like to ask the, the four panelists to make a short uh, introduction about what they think is relevant for the islands that the um, uh, Repower EU uh, package. Uh, and how this can help the islands towards the, uh, their path to climate neutrality. Um, and then I'd like, that would be short, and I would like to encourage you to ask questions and also the panelists to ask questions to each other and also challenge each other, maybe, to have um, a good discussion. Yeah? Is that okay? Good. All right. Uh, Thank you, Alexis, and uh, hello all you island climate activists and experts and, uh, and uh, um, doers of, of this uh, initiative. Um, last session, I mean, this is a tough one, so I thought I would give you a 15-minute speech here, so to make sure you all sleep well and soundly. So I have my package here, but uh, let's see, maybe I'll, I'll save you this. So uh, just let's go to serious business. So um, last year, you all remember, last year we were fighting climate change and COVID. Well, this year we are fighting climate change. Uh, we are fighting rising energy prices. We are fighting energy security and inflation. So I don't know if this is progress, but that's, <coughs> that's the reality. Uh, so to soften the blow on, on, on European individuals, you know, citizens and companies. So uh, the commission on this, in this situation last October, so uh, published uh, sort of a toolbox of, uh, of uh, uh, instruments that the member states can do to dampen indeed the, uh, this price impact, which is going through the roof, the wholesale prices. And uh, um, these tools were including things like state aid, um, regulation of prices, 
and, uh, uh, and, and such tax, tax uh, issues as well. Now, this March, and then today indeed, um, there was a follow-up under the Repower EU title, and all that, of course, uh, thanks to Putin and his adventure, uh, tragic adventure in Ukraine. And now here, um, the package today that just came out two hours ago, so is, it's got like 10 or, different, uh, 10 or more pieces of legislation, communications, and other things. I'm not going to go through all of that because it takes too much time. We focus on things which might be more relevant for, for us here, and that's particularly energy savings, energy efficiency, renewables mainly, and then a couple of words on, on, on uh, two other points. So, um, so let's start with the most important of all, and that's energy savings. And uh, there is a thing called uh, Save Energy um, Initiative that uh, was published, and, uh, and this one looks at two objectives. It has one objective, which is indeed to achieve these kinds of quick energy savings through uh, minor changes in the way we behave, the way we uh, live our everyday lives. And that can be from you know, driving less, changing the temperature of, of, the, um, uh, of, of cooling or of heating, like in a place like this hotel, by the way, and, uh, um, and uh, doing these kinds of little economies of, of everyday life. And the second part, the second objective is focused on structural energy efficiency. And this is the super important thing. And uh, it goes hand in hand with the renovation wave that uh, you may have heard of, this initiative to renovate buildings in Europe. And, uh, and the logic here is clear, because we all know here that it makes no sense to try to sort of swap fossil fuels into renewables and continue business as usual unless you first renovate all those buildings that uh, need to be heated or cooled. So uh, that's on the bottom of it. And, and therefore, the Repower EU, it goes beyond uh, what, what we had uh, very recently with the Fit for 55 uh, package, which is actually still being negotiated in the Council. So an example energy efficiency target was raised from 9% to 13% today. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, other, other ex uh, concrete examples which are there, for instance, so there's going to be a removal of subsidies for gas boilers already in 2025. That's pretty soon, huh? And, uh, and then things like uh, energy certificate obligations will be uh, uh, anticipated as well. Now, um, another super important point, and I think for island communities in particular, is renewables. <coughs> Excuse me. Renewables. And there, uh, we have a new target, 45% uh, of renewables uh, compared to uh, 40% by 2030. And this is, well, that, that, the, I'm stating the obvious when I say that islands are actually um, uh, have, a, have a very important role in, in, in getting these kinds of things done. Not just because you have a lot of uh, potential for renewables, and that we saw in Halki yesterday, we see it here every day on Rodos and we see it in the north with wind there. But it's also because you have the way and knowledge on how to approach citizens, how to approach small businesses, and how to um, engage people into these kinds of energy savings actions. There are many examples of that, and, and we've discussed those already earlier. So now let's go to solar. Um, today's uh, big deliverable was on solar. So there's a new EU solar strategy, and this includes a solar rooftop initiative. And uh, this introduces a target for solar energy, um, which is doubling what was there before. So we're talking about 320 gigawatts of, of our, uh, solar. And there's also going to be a legally binding obligation to install rooftop solar on buildings, on new buildings, and actually uh, on, on some uh, types, uh, some, some kinds of, of our, uh, existing buildings, mainly related to public uh, administration. And uh, the Commission is working, of course, a lot on, with industry to strengthen the supply chains, because we've seen that during COVID that uh, things get stuck in China, so we don't want that to happen again. And uh, we haven't forgotten wind in this context either, won't go into that. So on top of that, there's a set of actions to double the deployment rate of heat pumps and uh, uh, over the next five years, 10 million of them. 
and uh, there's going to be a massive investment in, in hydrogen as well. And this is uh, like, uh, there's going to be also a, a new facility, an advisory facility with the uh, European Investment Bank to help get these hydrogen investments done and deployed. Now, many islands may actually have a stake in this hydrogen uh, um, topic. We heard it earlier. And uh, uh, one reason is the aviation and the ferry transport that the islands depend on. And uh, um, the ETS system, so emission trading, is going to put transport fuels for these uh, kinds of transports under ETS, which means that you have to pay for, pay for pollution, basically, pay for emissions. At the same time, there's an intention to actually give free allowances, allowances to those planes and, and ferries which use hydrogen, for instance, or, or, or um, you know, clean, uh, clean energies, bio-kerosene when it's about planes. So maybe uh, there's something for islands there, and there are going to be millions of electrolyzers built uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming years. So who says that they have to be all on the mainland? I don't, at least. I would see opportunities in certain uh, places, uh, certain islands, to, uh, to be part of this and develop actually some jobs also as a, as a nice little side product. And uh, let me jump then into um, one point still, biomethane. I'm taking this up because when I visited uh, a Finnish island uh, some time ago, uh, the farmers told me how they are using biomethane to power their, to heat up, uh, heat their buildings and actually uh, they used it for um, uh, vehicles as well. So that can be relevant for certain, certain islands. And then we spoke earlier about rotors and the waste management challenges, hmm. biogas, waste, they could be something. Now, you asked me, Alexis, to say something on state aid, just quickly, sensitive subject. But actually the thinking in the commission is evolving on that. And it started already in October, and it went further today. So there's more leeway to give state aid to, uh, to companies who might be suffering under the energy bills currently. And uh, we will be coming up with more guidance on that, how to get those state aid decisions fast-tracked. Uh, so that's uh, one point as well. And then funding, uh, there are many novelties there. Um, basically what they do, they bring in flexibility and effective use of money, uh, transfer from different bud budgets to others, and, and, uh, and so on. But there's also a bit of like lose it, use it or lose it mentality towards the member states. If you don't, distribute the funding if you lose it. And, uh, and there we go. No time to elaborate. Just last word on permitting. So um, two things came out of Repower. There's a recommendation which explains smart ways of doing the permitting, and then there's some hard law on the member states that you have to deliver on. And there are things like setting caps to the time uh, a member state can, uh, can use to uh, treat the permit. And there's also, um, um, uh, there are also some, some things like tacit agreements which are brought in. If there's no reaction, consider it a deal, you know, approved, that type of stuff. Okay, let me conclude here. Um, these um, kind of changes that are listed here are from the package. Now, the package needs to be implemented, and for that, tomorrow, we intend to start a communication campaign together with the Covenant of Mayors uh, initiative that you know for cities. And I was kind of wondering that it would be nice if actually the island initiative would join this, this kind of uh, campaign, and that's about the energy savings particularly, that part. Because frankly, you know best what works, what doesn't, and how to uh, get people on board. Thank you. Thank you, um, and I'd like to pass the floor to Kostas. What is your take from this for the Greek islands? And I forgot to mention that you're also vice chair of FEDERN, so the European Network of Local Regional Energy Agencies. So uh, maybe you could uh, put that hat on as well. Thank you, Alexis. Um, welcome, everyone, and uh, happy to be here. Well, for, we know most of us each other, actually, you know, I've been in uh, the islands uh, energy world for many years now, with this guy and that guy, with many other guys. 
Um, so we have a very good experience and knowledge and feelings about uh, the, the energy in the islands. But now we have uh, uh, a fact today, which is rather important, the Repower EU. And just to give you a, a hint about, um, as an islander, uh, and uh, where I would literally see the discussion, it would potentially be in Repower, uh, Repower EU islands. Um, so I think that this would open a discussion of how can actually Repower EU relate more to the islands and, well, I think it is already clear that we have a Clean Energy for EU Islands initiative, which means that we are already recognize that there is something special about islands. So, uh, very quickly, uh, to, to, to give some, a few hints about the, the news we, we received uh, this noon from the Repower EU and already the, the points that uh, Aero already raised. Uh, and uh, coming from the islands, I would like to, to give you some impressions. So let's say we're talking about um, higher res penetration and with caps and well, with, a, with a stick or whatever. But, uh, you know, we see, as Mr. Calvelis mentioned earlier, if I'm not mistaken, about the, the stable, let's say, that the constant amount of renewables installed in the islands the, the, the last years and decades. Uh, so, you know, we, we would like to see more accelerated, let's say, licensing procedures. However, very often they are not uh, civil servants, so they are not the services, let's say, to, to proceed. Uh, for example, yesterday we were in Halki, and you know, we had a mayor, and I see him back there. And, well, you should know that there is only a single person, a single engineer on the island. And in order to proceed into public procurement for projects on the island, you need at least three. So he cannot actually proceed uh, on projects. We are discussing about a water network for more than six months, and we cannot actually proceed with a project. So. You know, the, the, it is good to have the top-down policies and the, um, uh, the momentum, but we need also to see how, at the bottom, we give the tools to facilitate and enable these policies. Another example that I would like to, to give is about, uh, and again, uh, addressing the higher res uh, installations about siting. We have a lot of uh, wind and uh, whatever other res project siting exercises on the islands. It's very often, you know, we have small islands like Halki, and you end up before because of licensing restrictions that, uh, like a hybrid uh, uh, power plant, there is a single location uh, that you can actually install it because all the parts of the islands in a small island, they would create some conflict with other users, etc. So we would like to see, you know, more like a participatory or citizen participation in siting. We can actually, uh, uh, as islanders, define the area where the projects could be implemented. Small scale islands with like two or three megawatts uh, uh, peak demand, they can host one hybrid plant. You know, wind turbines now, they are not more than, uh, less than one or two megawatts. So it will be a single project on the island. And that's, you know, obvious that it could be selected together with the citizens and not, you know, uh, in secrecy from them. Um, quickly also to address energy efficiency. We want to have uh, PVs on rooftops, definitely. Well, you need to know that in most of the islands there are cultural heritage uh, settlements and you are not allowed to put PVs on the, on the roofs. Okay? And again, there's no enough personnel in the archaeological services to process the different uh, applications and you end up stagnation. No PV projects, no PV panels on the, on the roofs. And finally, when it comes to storage, well, we need to see storage very much addressed into the island needs. And you need to know also that in the non-interconnected islands, we have huge amounts of curtailments. Roads is the best example. Kos, nearby, Kos Kalimnos uh, uh, electrical system, another second uh, very good example. Very high uh, curtailments. Wind production that's actually dropped into heat, that you can actually use it and have uh, green hydrogen. So we need to see, you know, the specifications and how we translate Repower EU into Repower Islands. And just to conclude, I think that all the effort with the Clean Energy for EU Islands, but, but, but also, as we're discussing it uh, with a memorandum of split being left, let's say, in hypnosis for the last couple of years because of the pandemic, uh, I think that the new crisis, the war crisis, can actually revive the discussion around the memorandum of split make use also of the Serica's uh, findings and the INI report that uh, Mr. Pichula yesterday uh, discussed and the momentum around uh, a European strategic framework for islands and uh, the Islands Pact to actually translate this new opportunity, the Repower EU, into a Repower EU Islands. So that was for me for introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to give the floor to Maria. I hope I'm looking at you <laughs> right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you hear me good. well? Can we confirm? Yes, very good. Okay, great. So, yeah, um, yes, the floor is yours for a short introduction and uh, comments of what you, uh, on what you've heard already. 
Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to, to everybody. And thanks for the invite, especially to my colleague uh, at the UI, Jan. Um, yeah, I'm joining you from, from Amsterdam today. I'm not very jealous because we have a bright day. Although I come also from Greece, so this is this uh, discussion is also relevant to see what is happening in, in my home country. So I don't want to sound repetitive, but uh, I want to put it in a more holistic, let's say, uh, you know, approach relevant to the uh, repowering you and the ILATS context. And I want to focus on, on the storage question. Already Costas raised that. And, um, and uh, it's true that um, storage is kind of um, missing, uh, you know, a uh, piece of the puzzle in the repowering you. And uh, of although storage is mentioned in the repower EU is mainly focused on the natural gas and the context of natural gas, but uh, not mainly on, on renewables that is really relevant to, to the island's context. And uh, we have also to see that this gap has been also identified in the EU Green, stra EU, uh, green Deal strategy. Um, so uh, it has been already you know, discussed in the previous panels that there needs to be tailor-made solutions for the islands, but uh, as we have already, uh, um, Aero mentioned, an EU solar strategy uh, published today. For me, it's an open question if we will have like an updated, you know. I would like us to see uh, the Repower EU as a long-term, uh, you know, investment package. Huh? Um, and this also connects to what, how we address this long duration storage and how this will be coupled also with, with the energy savings huh? that is a priority in the Repower uh, package. While at the same time, the Repower EU is dealing the, the affordability in the, in the short term and this is again relevant to, to the to the to the islands especially with the with the peaks in the energy demand uh, when we're talking also you know about touristic periods so on and so forth um, so yeah I want to conclude here and I hope that I gave some some uh, you know open open questions for for the later discussion so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. And I'd like to give the floor to Sean. Uh, you have been a big, big advocate of uh, community participation. So how all, all this translates into something communities can understand on the ground? So I need to stand up. It's impossible to speak when you're sitting. I mean, you have to participate in the, in the action here. I, I'm, I'm listening to all these very smart and wise people advising what to do and how to solve the crisis of the world. I think that's good. Somebody's caring about that. Uh, if you want to translate that into kind of a local community, what do you call it, understanding or a, a, a level of what's in it for me, then it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. But how do we translate in, this into kind of some necessary and useful tools for local innovation and, and, and capacity building and actions at the local level? Just to mention, I mean, Samsung was awarded the UN leaders, leader, climate leader at the COP meeting recently in Glasgow. So, I mean, you should applaud now, because this is where... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's, just, it's just to say, I was very, I was very surprised that we, we, we were awarded, because I mean, Samsung is a very old project, it is a very small project, and the other awardees were Paris, and a big Mexican million like Guadalajara, which is also a million city, and then Samsung, which is a small community in the middle of Denmark, that it was awarded a climate leader um, uh, kind of role or position. So my take on this is that we shouldn't think about winning anything here, just winning the, the possibility of surviving and staying in, in the game somehow, and use the instruments and tool that is given to us by the, the European Union, by the, the, by the programs and the structures and the funding schemes that is he here now available for us to look at. The problem with this is that we are small and the projects are getting bigger somehow, and we need to find a way to kind of coordinate this. I think the EU Clean Island Secretariat in the future has a very big role in organizing structures for a cooperation between islands. So community is seen from my perspective is not one island at a time. It is families of islands getting together in the endeavor and, and, and in the cooperation of being the living green labs of the future. So we're not on a winning agenda, but we are going from being best to next. 
meaning that we are operational in the changes. We, we are very easy to convince if there's a little funding in it. We are very <laughs> cheap to, to what you call it, to fail because it's not a big investment we're making on islands. We can actually be test labs for, for, for the future. But we like to be involved in the process and invited to participate so we, we make a capacity building education program for local islanders so we know what's, what, we, what we are undertaking and, and what the purpose of our role is. Because this is where it plays a significant role so anyone here could be the next climate leader of the UN or of the European Union if we are allowed to experiment and to participate in the most practical way we can, we can find out. And then, I mean, I have like my, my, my usual stake in this is we have to go from how and what to why. So we ask the question, but how do we solve urgent problems in the islands, which could be aging population, which could, which could be kids in the school and the local economy that makes us able to pay the bills and, and, and be able to participate as a strong, lively community also in the future. Because we are threatened now by rising energy prices and crisis in the world and an urgent or emerging climate crisis that is also putting a big pressure on communities like islands. So I think that the, the world is open for us to participate in this game here also. But we have to pay attention to all the, the, trap, uh, the traps in it because we can also be lost in translation somehow. Because the market is now asking for big projects. I mean, the next wind turbine is a 15 megawatt wind turbine. It's already kind of tested and will be in the market very soon. I mean, imagine in one of your islands that you have a 15 megawatt wind turbine on the island. I'm, I think the island will kind of flip over <laughs> and, and, and trip somehow. So scaling is, is, is going to be a future problem for us also. How do we stay in the game with a scaling industry that wants to take over the market and, and, and own and, and monopolize the market in the, the green transition? This is something that governments like because this is market competitive, but this is something that could be a threat to us and we need to organize around that and find out how do we participate in the best possible way. So that would be my kind of intro to this also. I think we have a chance here, but we should kind of focus on what is in it for us in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Um. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank all speakers that stuck to what we agreed and they made a short introduction so that there is room for discussion. Uh, there is a microphone available for you to raise questions. Um, so please go ahead if you have any. Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, your excellent points. Uh, my name is Therese Vakalis from the University of the Aegean. And uh, the question is about the, uh, the power uh, package and uh, the announcement. Um, we talk about solar, we talk about wind, but they are variable renewable energy systems. And uh, we in uh, Lesbos, we have a lot of geothermal uh, potential. And uh, my question uh, is related to the pact for skills, as it is mentioned, beside the, the power, and how this will work, because these technologies, not, not all of them have the same level of maturity. So we need uh, investments in uh, geothermal uh, energy and in order to make it in a large uh, scale uh, we need uh, a little bit more uh, information from uh, and your expertise about how this pact uh, for skills would work as it is mentioned in the announcement so thank you uh, uh, this was a question that i don't know the exact answer to but uh, <laughs> but interestingly i was going to say something about the pact of skills because uh, uh, what i did not say and i agree that with alexis actually that i'm not going to go to the skill discussion because otherwise too long, but um, uh, I would have mentioned indeed the Pact of Skills and why, because that's actually, it's a new um, initiative uh, that we've been working on with the uh, colleagues who are dealing with employment and indeed education policies in, in the Commission. And the whole logic is that this pact will focus on helping with the transition. Originally, actually, with these coal regions like in Greece, uh, Kozani, you know, places uh, of that kind, uh, but then also going broader. And that's what is your case in, in Lesbos, I think. So, and the logic is there that, okay, of course you need skills. You need staff you know, first, and then the staff has to have skills. And, and there, this is what this whole uh, program is aiming at. And, uh, I uh, would lie if I said that I know how it exactly works, because it's being developed. 
I will gladly take your coordinates and I'm going to find out. I know who to ask. That's a good thing. But since I have the, uh, the phone, uh, the microphone rather, so um, what came out today, uh, and that's very much linked to this, is um, there's a, uh, going to be a, um, an investment, a big project, which is uh, related to the um, Erasmus Plus program, uh, which will exactly go into, uh, into this direction. And I think there was another one. Let me see if I... Oh, yeah, okay. Well, then this was more sort of hydrogen specific. That's the clean hydrogen uh, joint undertaking. They are giving training to, to that. But indeed, Erasmus goes broader on that. So yeah, I stop there and I will get back to you because modalities, I don't know yet. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, I was thinking of asking uh, Maria since she's. Uh, uh, at the uh, School for Transnational Governance at the European uh, University Institute. Um, what do you think would be new skills that would be uh, required and that you, we should be you know, teaching students in the next decades to be able to deliver uh, the EU ambition to 2050? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so, um, and uh, in the School of Transnational Governance, we are, we are teaching policies, huh? we're teaching governance. And although I, I agree that for the deployment of renewables and uh, especially, you know, all the technologies that they are including in the uh, Repower EU, you, you might say that, of course, the obvious thing is that we, we um, push the new generation towards STEM education, uh, towards towards, uh, you know, engineering. Um, I would say that uh, what is needed also are people that they are strong in policies, that they are strong in local policies, especially when we're talking about uh, local islands, that they are strong in skills in terms of governance of, of the transition, because transition is not going to happen from one day to the other. Huh? It's going to take long, so we need really people that they, they know the regulation, uh, both at EU level, but both also at, at island and national level, that would be really important and this will for me really accelerate the deployment of the new renewables because in many cases you have you have problems about regulations about about uh, you know investments how you you touch you know the funds and uh, those those skill sets are, are missing uh, in, um, in in many cases uh, so not only you know boost stem education but also you know uh, those elements of governance of, of regulation uh, and uh, investments in um, in renewable energy, so kind of energy economics, I would say. Yes, makes sense. Um, and I'd like to bring the discussion a little bit to a topic that it is in the uh, the package, but we didn't quite uh, mention it so far, which is state aid. Um, and I would like to ask. Uh, Costas, what, what innovation you can think, you think that uh, new or flexible or revised uh, stated rules could uh, bring and could, uh, you know, enable? Yeah, uh, well, thank you, Alexis. Uh, yeah, the truth is that, um, yeah, state aid has been always, uh, well, the, the, the unknown factor in different equations and difficult to treat. But uh, under the current uh, conditions, we see the momentum provided by the relaxation of the um, provisions of state aid, and uh, we would feel that this should be also specified for the, for the islands. Um, definitely, as discussing before, uh, regarding the challenges in the islands, I think that uh, solutions like uh, you know, financing, let's say, the added value or the, 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 um, the increased cost of uh, innovation uh, in hybrid plants. We, we recently had uh, you know, there's an ongoing discussion between uh, Greece, and I will make it a little more national now because you know, we have a lot of non interconnected islands uh, burning uh, fuel oil and diesel, like this island. You know, we passed by the power plant yesterday for those that came to Halki. Um, and you know, we've been trying in different ways for several years uh, to, to decarbonize. Um, and for doing so, you know, we, we need storage in the non-interconnected islands or interconnections. Uh, and in many cases, interconnections are not here yet, and the hybrid plans there are to come. And there's a discussion with the Commission regarding the, the legislative provisions and the regulatory framework under which this will happen. Uh, however, what we've been saying from the islands, because we have several small islands that 
they are, let's say, adequate, and we heard about the Greco Islands initiative. So they are adequate for, for small scale hybrid uh, stations. And in this case, we would actually, you know, deploy different uh, storage technologies and innovative storage technologies that, as European Union, we need to invest into innovation. And in this case, you know, we can really enable the, the, the living lab and the test bed uh, approach of actually testing different storage solutions and using state aid in order to finance this additional cost of uh, innovation. Uh, uh, and the, yeah, this, this would be you know, for smaller scale islands, but then if we talk about higher scale, uh, uh, higher, higher level and uh, higher capacity projects, then we talk a lot, uh, especially in the Mediterranean, and I will make it a little more transnational, but in the, you know, Mediterranean uh, uh, basin, uh, that we talk a lot lately about uh, floating with turbines. And again, you know, there is a, a margin then that needs to be met, um, and state aid can support about mobilizing floating with turbines, and this is an ongoing discussion also in Greece and uh, neighboring countries, and I think that it has been also uh, considered by the Commission with, uh, with previous studies about uh, the marine technologies uh, development. And uh, last but not least, and because, uh, you know, state aid has been discussed under Repower EU about uh, different um, uh, activities, you know, the, unfortunately for me, uh, fortunately for others, uh, and especially for owners of these settlements, um, you know, economies in the islands are very much depending on, uh, on tourism. Uh, and, uh, well, for smaller businesses that they are may very much uh, affected by, the, by tourism fluctuation and they have been affected the previous years by the pandemic and the smaller amounts of tourism, the higher energy costs now in the tourism industry, it's also affecting uh, these businesses. In, in the islands, the majority of the economic activities, they are related with tourism. Um, and uh, the higher cost uh, that they have to face now as summer comes, it is uh, in many cases uh, too much for them. And I'm not talking about only big businesses like big hotels, but also the small, uh, small and medium enterprises in the islands that they are related with the uh, uh, tourism industry. So we think that uh, besides of uh, agricultural sector and other sectors that could be directed state aid to support the maintaining the energy cost, tourism industry, especially you know, small-scale tourism uh, industries should also be eligible for this kind of support. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, maybe we could take a, a question from you. Uh, thank you. No? No, yeah. My name is Maya. I'm coming from uh, Croatia, working on uh, energy transition on Croatian islands. I have uh, two short questions, I hope, for uh, Commission and for Soren. Uh, so I'm uh, interested, as I always, I very often have a role of reality check, so I will not miss the opportunity also to, uh, to ask uh, uh, in this way. I'm not asking what if we don't reach the goals, but when we will not reach the goals, uh, what will be the co uh, consequences to the European uh, uh, nations and how we are going to uh, s uh, split the responsibilities between the members. I'm very curious about it. Uh, and also, as I hope that we are all on the same track as European Union is uh, telling everyone about uh, having the citizens and islanders uh, in the middle of the transition. And uh, whoever works with uh, uh, raising awareness, education, and Soren was also mentioning about uh, uh, how important it is to work on the field constantly. We have some concrete um, needs that we cannot reach for uh, quite some years. So it took us uh, three or four years to convince our governments to give us money for the education and consultancy of the local authorities to boost the, uh, the energy transition. They, it took them three years. So we don't have any more time of uh, you know, talking about uh, energy. So I'm, I'm wondering, Soren, are we able to convince like European Commission in a way that uh, uh, give us uh, an open uh, space uh, to uh, create these educational hubs that we are we're talking about in a way that we don't need to go through horizon and life programs which are you know more taking our time than uh, creating an impact that we need Who would like to start <laughs> Well, I can maybe start then because I, I don't have the obligation of being kind of honest like the European Union have. I can be more kind of, <laughs> well, well I, 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 there's a point in time. So, so if we are restricted by some of short, short time frames in projects, then we might not be successful because it takes maybe more time than just the project period, like two years, three years. And then kind of 
the other thing is that when you write a proposal and you get into a project also, you, 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 have, to, you have to decide what is necessary for the next two, three years, and you might be wrong, and, and in, in, after one year, after year one, or after year two, you might have to adjust your expectations, or maybe expand your expectations, because you're either going faster or slower in the process here also. And I think there's a problem in this also, because we don't have the capacity to be very bureaucratic. We have to be a little bit bureaucratic to understand the European system, but very pragmatic and practical in, in, in the exchange with the local community. And this is sometimes not a conflict, but it, 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 it is not really easy to document when you need to report back to the, to, to the sponsor or to, to the project. And I think this is an ongoing problem that we're always suffering from, that the people who are writing the proposals and who are in charge of this also kind of need to make uh, decisions about where we're going with it, but after a while we need to adjust it because people are changing um, and, and, and projects are changing a little bit. I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it is kind of in that direction. The other thing is, I'm working from the Samsung Energy Academy, which is an independent institute in Denmark. We, are, we have arms links to the local municipality, we have arms links to the government, so we can actually say and do things that is not, I don't have to adjust it to existing policy or, or, or decisions on municipality because I'm not, I'm, 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 I have a steering committee I, I, I have to respond to. But so, so they can be in opposition to the existing and actually speak on behalf of citizens or projects or development and thereby be kind of the, the, the stone in the shoe that makes people think differently <laughs> after a little while. And I think that is very important that we create these centers of innovation in local communities also. So you have, you're not a municipality because then you have a lot of other obligations that can disturb the creativity of making change. Because you have a lot of other, uh, uh, what do you call it, the jobs you have to do here. And I think that is maybe the shorter version of a, of a long discussion because this is something that is challenging the system a little bit because bureaucracy cannot always be creative in, 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 because you'll be, well, yeah, yeah, but, but you'll be looked after by, by, by the administration and all these sort of things here also. So you also have some duties that you have to fulfill and tick the boxes and all these sort of things. So a little bit more civil disobedience is needed here. Maybe piracy or, I don't know, being a little bit more Viking or I don't know what you call it down here. <laughs> Uh, thanks, sir. It was good that you kicked off this. So, um, uh, on that, maybe on, on the on the project aspect, if I got your question right, so I, I think there's a. I, mean, there are, I look at it from the Commission side, of course, because I've been also drafting these proposals and, and evaluating and, and seen seen many things, and then trying to do it in a way that it then you know supports, of course, whatever uh, the policy objective is. So I think. Um, you learn by doing there, and if, the one thing is that, of course, it's in the interest of that officer, project officer, uh, who gets a bid or whatever and, and, and chooses a winner, so it's in his interest, actually, that that project will work out. So it really is, because for us it's a lot more work to stop something that is going wrong. So we have an interest in finding a way, if the uh, contractor has difficulties, to find some kind of a solution. So I think that's a little bit for anybody at least who's been doing a little bit longer these things so it, it that, that's what you do and then the other thing what you learn doing these things is um, that if you write if we write proposals well I mean the, the, the ten texts so we build in certain amount of flexibility there for things that we cannot foresee and uh, and we're just talking here about uh, an, a case that I was involved in so we did quite radical stuff there so that we would uh, like, you know, go halfway with a project and then decide that then we meet up with the contractor and we discuss and we decide where we go from there. So we have a broad objective but nothing, uh, you know, different scenarios and then let's just decide where we go. So the idea is that we give much more freedom to the uh, uh, consortium here to come up with ideas and then if they sound good, yeah, let's do it. Uh, so it's, and that kind of mentality, I don't know, I mean, I see that spreading in, in my little part of the commission, but uh, of course, these are, this is always about people. And then uh, quickly, um, I think you spoke about the what if the, uh, these big plans do not, or if the member states do not implement them, meet the, meet the uh, expectations. So, um, well, uh, there are a few things that the commission can do there. I mean, uh, one thing is, of course, on this monitoring. So we do that in a much more organized manner that was done in the, in, in the past. So we have a, indeed 
um, try to simplify these me methods. And then what is maybe a bigger difference is that now before giving funds to uh, whatever purpose it is, uh, say renewables, so we actually ask the member states to do a planning, a pretty robust planning on how they do it. It, it applies to the re recovery funds as well. And, and this logic started with COVID in particularly, you know, get much more um, like, like better, better preparation, let's put it this way, so that the member state already has to think how we do it, where do we put the money, and, and roughly what kind of timelines. And then on top of that, you have indeed this um, back and forth contacts all through the time uh, to see that if there's a gap coming up, so we have to see it before it's too late. And then um, usually it's about negotiations, how you uh, get things going. And then of course, sometimes there are these um, uh, possibilities which are built in there. For instance, there's one uh, member state uh, in the North Sea which has difficulties in reaching their renewable energy targets. And uh, so what was built in was a transfer mechanism so that they can do a little bit about what they call statistical transfers between the other neighbor who is exceeding them by far. So there's a little bit of playing when you talk about EU level target of let's say 45% of renewables or something like that. So different things. Um, thank you very much. Unfortunately, the time is up. We got some really long questions that required really long answers. <laughs> and so I would like to thank all of you uh, and also all of you who are still here. <laughs> so thank you very much.